Good day to everyone and welcome back. I'm thrilled to have a panel of great industry experts to discuss uh, this morning, building the best EMR EHR experience for your organization. Um, <clears throat> of course, I say EHR, some say EMR, you say potato, I say potato, but we, <laughs> <laughs> we know what we're talking about. In any case, um, I am so <clears throat> excited to have everyone here uh, this morning. Every single person on this panel is not only an expert, but they have real lived experience. Um, I think what I'm just going to do, because the, the, the easiest thing to do will be, I'm going to go around in a clockwise circle um, and have each uh, panelist introduce her or himself um, their title, role, organization, and uh, very, very briefly, their connection to this topic, although it will be fairly obvious by the titles and roles. Uh, let me start with uh, Anna Schoenbaum. Welcome. Thanks for having me today, Mark. I am the Associate Vice President of Application and Pen Medicine. I oversee the EHR and third-party clinical systems, also digital health, predictive health, clinical imaging and information services application and training and education. I have 30 years of healthcare experience, 20 years in informatics and health IT. I am a nurse by trade and went into management early on in my career. And today I'm leading roles in digital transformation initiatives, which does focus on our clinical provider and burnout. Um, I am also a um, certified in informatics and hold a doctorate in nursing practice. Thank you. Wonderful. Clearly, you have a close connection to this topic. Thank you. Welcome, Anna. Um, Dr. Alan Chawi. Thank you, Mark, for having us. Uh, my name is Alan Chawi. I am a, a family physician in uh, private practice in the North Shore of Boston uh, at Congenial Healthcare. Uh, Family Medicine North. Uh, I also, I am the past president of the Massachusetts Medical Society 2018-2019. Uh, I also uh, co-chair the uh, MMS MHA Joint Task Force on Physician Burnout that was established in 2018, which was created uh, a first of its kind joint task force to address physician burnout with a mission to identify and prioritize effective strategies to mitigate burnout and to advocate for statewide adoption of identified strategies and practices with Dr. Defosse. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelley. Dr. Defosse. Well, Mark, first, thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. It's a privilege to, to speak with you and, and your guests. Um, my name is Steve Defesse. I'm I've been a practicing radiologist for over 30 years. I uh, still practice one to two days a week. Two days a week, I'm the physician executive as VP of Clinical Integration at the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. And two days a week, I'm an independent consultant at Defosse's uh, Consulting LLC. Uh, my connection to this subject was as a physician executive traveling around the state in Massachusetts speaking with physician leaders, it became quite clear to me that uh, one of the main obstacles to delivering high quality healthcare to our patients was the rate of physician and clinician burnout across the Commonwealth. Uh, about the time that this realization came to me, Dr. Chow, as you mentioned, uh, was president elect of the Massachusetts Medical Society. And I've had the great good fortune and luck of working in practice, clinical practice with Dr. Chow for approximately 30 years. And so he and I sat down together and tried to figure out how we could bring the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association and the Massachusetts Medical Society together for the first time in a statewide task force to do something to improve the quality of care and the life of the clinicians and physicians across the state. And we you know, recognized that the most useful thing we could do was form a statewide task force on physician burnout and then try to elevate um, you know, people's understanding of this that it was in fact a crisis and needed to be addressed to try to bring a suite of technical solutions to our members uh, to publish articles uh, to that effect and to accomplish a whole bunch of other goals, which we've done. Uh, it's been uh, a great work in progress. We still have more work to do. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Defusse. And last but definitely not least, my friend, Jason Hess. We meet in all the best places, virtual and in person. <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've done a lot this year. And Mark, we really appreciate the association with you guys. 
Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jason Hess. I'm the Executive Vice President of Provider Success at Class. I've been at Class almost 19 years. I started, I think, as employee number nine or 10. We were much, much smaller back then. Um, just by way of background, I um, when I started at Class, the first research project I worked on was CPOE adoption. You know, how many physicians in the country were entering their own orders? And at the time, it was less than 1%. The next thing I worked on was barcode med administration. At the time, less than 1% of hospitals were doing it. Um, so it's, it's been fun. For, this is how I've kind of grown up in the industry. Thousands of provider calls, honestly, with just executives all over the world now as classes expanded um, internationally. About four years ago, I, um, we started the Arch Collaborative. This was an idea from one of our colleagues, Taylor Davis. And we had a handful of providers that started measuring the success of their EHRs. And that's now grown to over 250,000 clinician responses in 10 countries around the world. So we've, we've, we have an incredible data set that we continue to learn from. And one of the big factors we're constantly looking at is physician burnout. So it's fun for me to be on this panel. I recognize some names and faces for sure and, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. This was so great. By the way, I'll just add a strange fun fact um, I've had the opportunity to travel uh, extensively in Europe and a few times on business in Europe. Um, I found out when I was in Spain in 2017 that they actually have federal regulations that in effect make barcode uh, meds administration impossible. That kind of blew me away. So yep. everybody needs to work on something. <laughs> I just thought I would mention that since you had referenced it. Uh, and, and it's interesting, that's why the, the HIMS levels have different requirements, Mark, yes. as you jump from the United States to other countries, right? Right. It's interesting. Yeah, the, the HIMSS analytics people actually had to take barcoded meds administration off the list for Spain okay. because it's not possible. So everyone has different challenges. Well, let me just do a little bit of a level set. You know, it's fascinating to talk about this subject because it feels as though we're in a really, at a really interesting inflection point now. Uh, first of all, the alarm has been sounded. People are aware of physician burnout and, and clinician burnout. Some nurses are, are stressed also around EHR use. And we're starting to make real progress. I'll be turning to you uh, in a little bit, Jason, to talk about some of the things that are happening in the Arch Collaborative. But it still remains a huge issue. And many physicians, whether fairly or unfairly, saddle uh, a, lot, a lot of responsibility onto their dissatisfaction with EHR use. And as we found, and I know you found in your research, it, sometimes they're actually talking about things that really aren't about EHR use, but everything kind of gets kitchen sinked. Um, what I'd like to ask everyone, I'll start with Anna and then I'll go to Drs. Charlie and Dimple we'll say, um, what, what is the state right now? When you talk to end users, what kinds of things are they saying and what are their biggest challenges? Um, and Anna, I know that's a part of the core of your job at, at Penn. So uh, what, what are you hearing right now? Well, I think with all the, um, the healthcare landscape right now, I think people are overwhelmed. Um, I think um, from uh, the nursing shortage or clinical shortage, pharmacy shortage, it is overbearing, but they are grateful to have technology to play a factor. However, we need to balance that factor with the right data at the right time. And, um, and they're overloaded sometimes with too much information and the wrong technology or the unintended conse consequences. So I think it's just striking a right balance, but having a good governance structure of what is added to make sure that we add value to our clinicians during these difficult times. Absolutely, beautifully said. Uh, Dr. Shawi and Dr. Defose, I know you've done a lot of volunteer work on that committee. Tell us about that and what you've learned so far. And um, I don't see torches and pitchforks in your hands. So at least you're not <laughs> a part of the French Revolution yet. Thank you, Mark. So uh, I will start by saying that, um, you know, the alarm has been sounded 
And as you know, they did a, a few studies and uh, essentially in 2018, one out of two uh, physicians were demoralized, dissatisfied. And, um, and then the pandemic uh, with COVID, um, you know, accentuated this a little bit more. And now we have uh, eight out of 10 physicians that have the same symptoms. So I will talk to you from my uh, stance as a primary care physician. Uh, in in practice, uh, as 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 I see it, and essentially, I will say I am not just talking about physician burnout. I am talk uh, talking about the whole team. Uh, the, the whole team is being burnout. Uh, I'm talking about my staff all the way from the, the the my staff answering the phones, my medical assistants, my nurse practitioners, and um, my mental health. Uh, staff here in the office, everyone is feeling the burn. Uh, every, everyone is, uh, is feeling the administrative burden uh, that is actually taking away from patient care and uh, making uh, providing health care a lot more difficult. So I will give you a few points. Number one, prior authorization has been draining the resources financially, emotionally, uh, and, and, and clinically. Uh, from, from the patients. If, if you order a CT scan or a certain medication, you spend uh, 35 to 50 minutes on the phone to beg for prior authorization. Uh, referrals. Referrals are completely useless. I have resources on the phones uh, asking for referrals to see a specialist. And uh, since I've been in practice, I don't know if any referrals have been ever denied. Uh, and then number three, uh, the, the, the other administrative burden of quality measurements. Uh, you know, you're, you're measuring, you're, you're being paid for certain qualities. And I, I agree, I'm a quality person. I, I strive to deliver the highest quality cost-effective care for my patients. Mm -hmm. And I believe in quality. But in order to measure qualities, you have to actually uh, use your AHR. You have to buy a software um, like uh, Arcadia, for example, which is a population health management software that you have to spend money, resources, and staff to manage. So to make a long story short and not to uh, sound like I'm complaining, uh, it is the administrative burden that has nothing to do with patient care is taken away from the profession and the yeah. joy of practicing medicine. Yeah, and many feel that way. Dr. Defosse. Yeah, uh, certainly a great summary, uh, Dr. Chowie. But what I'd like to emphasize is that clinician burnout, whether it's a nurse or a doctor or a phlebotomist, is not a personal weakness. It's not a mental illness. It's not a problem with the individual. The World Health Organization in 2019 in the ICD-11 came out with a definition of burnout, and they said burnout is not a medical condition. It's not a disease. It's an yes. occupational phenomenon. It's a workplace hazard. And the National Academies of Medicine came out and said that burnout occurs when there's an imbalance between the, the task that you're tasked with to do in your job and the tools you're given to be able to accomplish those goals. When you have too many tasks and not enough tools and you're spending your time checking boxes and jumping through hoops and doing things that aren't relative, relevant to actually helping a patient get better, that's what drives burnout. Um, you know, Dr. Chow, we mentioned, you know, prior authorization, we've heard about unnecessary documentation, quality measurements, which are clunky, that aren't uniform across systems that are all different, all different, you know, um, ways to measure the same uh, exact quality metric. And then, of course, quality metrics that aren't even um, accurate. In other words, you know, you're asked to yeah. do something which isn't even going to benefit the patient. So these are what I would call unnecessary administrative burdens, which can be removed from the clinician. There is... Uh, in healthcare, uh, sort of necessary uh, clinical burdens. In other words, we can't always cure the patient. We right. deal right. with unknowns. We make judgments and sometimes they're incorrect. We can't take that stress away, but fortunately, clinicians are generally more resilient than the general public and we can handle that stress. But what's breaking our clinicians now is these unnecessary administrative burdens, which aren't part and parcel of being a healthcare worker. Right. Now, why should the public care about this? 
Well, there's three reasons why the public patients should care about clinician burden. Number one, you're all humanitarians and you care about these people that are delivering this care and suffering. Uh, you know, clinicians who are burned out have, in addition to decreased satisfaction with their job, increased incidence of substance use disorder, alcoholism, divorce, depression, anxiety, and sadly, suicide. You know, you care about number two, you care about the patients. And so we know that patient satisfaction, patient engagement, patients more likely to follow the doctor's advice is higher when the doctor isn't burned out. Therefore, the quality of care clinicians deliver when they're not burned out is higher. And it turns out the safety of the care that clinicians deliver is higher when the clinician isn't burned out. And then lastly, if you care about the cost of healthcare in America, it turns out that burned out clinicians are more likely to cause increased costs in a whole host of different ways we can talk about if we need to. But if you care about clinician, if you care about the patient, if you care about the system, you have to care about burnout. I, absolutely. And that leads us right to the doorstep of Jason Hess. Uh, Jason, you and your colleagues uh, in the Arch Collaborative at CLASS have been doing amazing research. Um, things are starting to look up a tiny bit. Tell us about what's going on and what you're learning right now. And particularly when we were together last week in Cleveland, we were talking about um, the pandemic also. And I, I know all three clinician leaders here uh, are, are, are in the trenches there and it's, it's very difficult. So what are you learning? Well, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the comments from those on the panel with me. And we we've sound, found largely the same thing through our research that EHR satisfaction is not strongly correlated with burnout, it, it is one of those items that are listed. So we do ask a few questions on the Arch Collaborative survey. And that's, again, this is a survey link we would send to an organization like Penn Medicine as an example that they would then forward out to their clinicians. And then we're able to get <clears throat> not just a top-down CIO perspective of how happy they are with their EHR, but hundreds or even thousands of responses from a particular organization. When you aggregate that with over 250 organizations around the world that we've now had measure or benchmark their satisfaction, you get a lot of really good information. And again, two of those questions we ask are around burnout. Um, the, the factors that we see are chaotic work environment, too much time spent on bureaucratic tasks, lack of effective teamwork, um, lack of shared values with my organization, no personal control over my workload. Um, so, so these are a lot of the same things that you've just heard. Um, and I think my panelists would agree they're seeing the same thing. But as class watches the EHR, um, are there things that you can do with the EHR to help reduce burnout? And one of the, the big ones that we just looked at um, a few months ago was, was training. So if, he, if your EHR is part of this, it's not everything, but what can you do around training to help, you know, uh, physicians that are just feel encumbered by, by this expensive software that they need to use to care for patients? And one of the learnings we found was that those who strongly disagree that their ongoing training is helpful and effective are three and a half times more likely to stay if they're completely burned out. Yeah. And so that does matter. If I'm a physician and I just, I'm not a good user of my particular EHR, well, then this just compounds the problem of all the other symptoms or causes that I'm feeling. And if I can get more efficient, because I think things like attorneys and the government and, um, you know, uh, payers, all the requirements for documentation, it just adds complexity. And a lot of that stuff you can't control. You just have to document it and capture it somehow. So if you can help physicians navigate that in a more seamless way, um, then, then that does help. And I've got some really cool personal stories. I've shared, Mark, you've heard these, but that really um, excite me to just and, and energize me to keep working on this research to show that, in fact, there are things you can do with documentation, reducing that burden, helping physicians navigate the HR um, in a better format. And when we do that and go back and remeasure these organizations, their, their satisfaction improves and, and burnout drops on that particular factor, which is pretty exciting. So yeah. again, I know that I know we're dealing with just a piece of this on the EHR specifically, and that's class is kind of in the game of differentiating the vendors and once live on an EHR, how you who's happiest on, on a particular EHR, that's the Arch Collaborative largely shows. Um, this is kind of our focus. Wonderful. Anna, what, per, uh, why don't you respond to what Jason just shared, um, what, uh, about, especially about training and about how you help um, 
end users, physicians, nurses, and others uh, to feel better about uh, their usage of the EHR. Um, oh, yeah, Anna, go and then and then Dr. Chelly, if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. Anna. Great. Um, you know, we have um, also surveyed and used um, our results from um, Jason's work at Penn Medicine. Um, but just to step back regarding um, Penn Medicine promoting a culture of sharing and continuing education for our clinicians, we do it in multiple ways, but I want to talk about three transform transformation partners, which will address um, the education. So we kind of tackle problems or say clinical burnout, maybe in a three-prong approach uh, with three partners, and that's the information services which I help um, lead. And we look at just technical um, enhancements, optimization, and looking at best practice and configuring the system as we get new updates to address some issues um, with clinicians' workflows. But we also have clinical informatics at the table, which are from the office of our CMIO or nursing informatics or other informatics disciplines who look at improving um, clinical processes, establishing clinical standards and improving outcomes. And so they're there as we're addressing the problems with clinical burnout. And then we have another team called EHR Transformation, and they are the ones that do the shoulder to shoulder. Um, we have a, a program called PEP, and that is stands for Pin Chart, which is our EHR branding, efficiency and personalization. And they'll do that one-to-one -one education of any kind of enhancements or optimization workflows so that we can make sure that our clinicians are educated on the new processes or anywhere there's difficult um, issues. And we kind of take this approach at Penn Medicine and it's been really successful. And there may be key initiatives to tackle certain problems, but we do it kind of uh, from a design standpoint, outcomes, establishing standards, and then education and reinforcement. Wonderful. And if I may say so, I need some pep in my life too. So that's a good acronym. Uh, Dr. Chowey, uh, I'm sure you have a different kind of pep too. I, I, I'm also looking for more pep. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, uh, Jason and Anna, you are absolutely correct. Uh, training is very important. And uh, I will tell you that as myself, I love the EHR. Uh, the EHR, in my opinion, is the best thing that ever happened to healthcare because I practiced in the past with paper charts. And now I, uh, I, I am a super user uh, for one of the uh, most more common EHRs. So training is very, very important. But the EHRs are uh, far from being uh, perfect. Uh, and, 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 and we have been, uh, I have personally turned blue in the face talking to people about interoperability yeah. and the ability of other of my, of my specialists to see the, 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 my notes and, and my referrals. So for example, I would refer a patient to see a, a, a specialist uh, my staff gets a phone call from that specialist asking them to print my note, fax it to them in order for the patient to be seen. Also, uh, you know, have, make sure that I have a referral there, even though the referral is entered in the EPIC, uh, sorry, in the EHR. And uh, also uh, everything is being done according to the EHR's uh, um, capabilities. So the fact that uh, they don't talk to each other is a big, big problem. And I do not understand why in 2021, we still have this problem. The other thing that I will say that I wanted to mention before is uh, there in, in the study that was done um, at the Physician Foundation in 2018, they found out that 23% of physician time is being spent in administrative trivia. And that's quarter of my time that's being spent away from my patient. Not only that, but they, what they didn't account for is the, the two to three hours every night of pajama time that, uh, that the clinicians, the physicians spend in their house after they put their kids to bed. Um, so. Yes, it's a huge issue. Uh, Dr. Defosse, I know you have some thoughts on that and I believe you can share a little bit 
uh, <clears throat> about even some surveying that you've done? Sure. Well, I, I would just underscore, you know, the fact that Dr. Chowie mentions a fax machine in 2021 yeah. is remarkable. I think we're the only industry that still uses them. And I will say it's not Dr. Chowie's fault. I, I you know, speak with physician leaders from across the state as part of my job. And I hear time and again, this interoperability challenge. In fact, one doctor told me when he's got a specialist in his office that comes from the academic medical center and sits down the hall from him, that specialist has to write something on paper, fax it downtown, they, they scan it and then put it into his EHR and send it back. And the two of them are 10 feet apart from each other. It's just, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, yeah. It, yeah, can you imagine, you know, in any other industry that'd be putting up with this? But no, in that's terms exactly of, right. yeah. in, in terms of, I, I'm, I'm happy to tease a little bit of proprietary survey results. As part of my job as a consultant at Defos as Consulting, I worked with um, a, a, a number of FQHCs in a state that I, I can't share with you right now, but I will be publishing with National Academy of Medicine in the not too distant future. We, we surveyed 16 FQHCs the clinicians in these centers, all different clinicians, not just physicians, but all clinicians in the center, psychiatry, you know, dental, et cetera, pharmacy. We had a 67% survey uh, participation rate, which is, as you know, remarkable for healthcare or any, really any survey. And uh, the results I thought were quite interesting. The, uh, you know, we did the survey, the sort of the standard survey, and of course your administrative burden results are not a surprise. You could all write, to, write the results down before I tell you, so I won't share those with you. But we did ask folks, in addition to their level of burnout, um, what stresses the COVID pandemic, the opioid epidemic, sexism and racism have had on them. And this is relatively if, you know, new, if not unique data, and I thought you might be interested in it. Uh, clearly, the COVID uh, pandemic um, has put stress on all our workforce, including in healthcare. The opioid epidemic has been a chronic stress uh, on these workers. But what I wanted to share with you is that we asked folks, first of all, the burnout rate of these clinicians was really remarkably below the national average, and that was a surprise. Um, the overall burnout rate was around 40, 41% for clinicians, about 43% for doctors. That's at least 20 points lower than the national average. You know, we think that maybe the reason for that is embedded in the survey. We asked if their personal core values were reflective of the work culture, and over 95% of people agreed with that. So I think if your mission lines up with the mission of your, your leadership and your organization, that's protective of burnout. Um, but when we broke it down a little further, and we asked, have you ever experienced racism on the job? It turns out that 14% of respondents experienced racism on the job. Among white respondents, it was 10%. Among black respondents, it was really a terrible 35%. And among Asian respondents, it was 18%. And one surprise in the survey is that ages 25 to 44 experienced most of the racism. Uh, and in fact, they, you know, I'll talk about sexism in a minute, but that same age group experienced most of the sexism. That's an age group that feels more burned out and more stress than other age groups in multiple surveys. And so it's, it's something that leaders have to keep an eye on. In terms of, uh, you know, racism, when it does occur on the job, we asked how much stress does it, does it result in? And for at least a third of the time, it results in very high levels of stress across all three racial groups. And that stress is higher among female respondents. And, you know, that's a trend that we see in national surveys that female respondents are under more stress and, um, and have higher rates of burnout. And when you actually look at the burnout rate of the various races in our survey, Asians had a burnout rate of 41%. Blacks had a burnout rate of 43% and whites 39%. So roughly all around 40%. But if you asked if you um, have experienced racism on the job and your answer is yes, you look at what their burnout rate is, Asians uh, roughly the same at about 33%, but blacks who experienced racism on the job, their burnout rate is a, an astounding 71%. Whites who experienced racism on the job, their burnout rate is also higher at 54%. Conversely, if you ask, um, if you look at the population of black clinicians who don't experience racism on the job, their burnout rate is only 28%. So you look at, you take, you know, the black population of clinicians that we surveyed, if they experience racism on the job, their burnout rate is 71%. And if they don't, their burnout rate is 28%. It's just remarkable. When, when racism does occur in the office, 
It occurs primarily from patients and patients' families, but coworkers are not an insignificant source of racism. This is a real opportunity for improvement. Similarly, the sexism results were along the same lines I just described and sort of to cut to the chase, if you look at you know sexism, you know not surprisingly is experienced much more by females than males on the job. And if you look at females who don't experience sexism on the job, their burnout rate is below average at 37%. But if they do experience sexism on the job, it's almost double, it's 63%. So again, um, reducing sexism on the job can dramatically reduce burnout on the job. And females are more likely to experience sexism by, from patients, most likely, but that's followed by coworkers and then family members. So coworkers are not an insignificant source of sexism on the job. Um, so I just I, I think that that's some food for thought. We'll be publishing all these uh, results in much more detail in the future. Uh, but in addition to all the things that we've been talking about, EHR optimization, personalization, reducing clinician burnout, sorry, uh, sorry administrative burden. We also need to think about how we're treating people and if we're treating people respectfully on the job. And we have to think of new ways to protect our frontline staff from abuse from the patients, whether it's violence, sexism, or racism. Well, I, I appreciate all of those insights tremendously, Dr. Diffelsey. In fact, um, one of our earlier sessions in, in this virtual conference uh, involved uh, uh, a physician leader at Cambridge Health Alliance who uh, Dr. Uh, Seth, who uh, has developed a, um, a very unique program uh, to deal with uh, disruptive, including violent patients. So I can only imagine that on top of the pandemic, on top of experiences, personal experiences with racism, sexism, really, that would be a lot <laughs> for anyone to handle. Um, other panelists, your reactions. Anna, do you have any thoughts per what Dr. Defosse just shared? Yeah, you know, um, the fascinating data, um, I think that that's going to um, be able to be leveraged on how we um, help our clinicians and um, make sure we're thoughtful in any um, in the work environment. And um, for me, looking over the digital transformation strategies is just to be real thoughtful and meaningful and not to add the burden for our clinicians um, and to be sensitive and to be timely with our support. Um, it is really um, difficult times, challenging times, and um, we just need to be sensitive to um, the research here. Absolutely. Dr. Chawa, your, your thoughts. Oh. I, I agree with uh, with uh, uh, everyone on the panel, and um, I'm 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 hoping uh, that with COVID, that layered even more stresses on our uh, physician uh, 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 or now clinician team, uh, that um, that all those uh, anxiety <clears throat> and, and, and depression that happened through uh, our healthcare workers that put their life uh, uh, on the line to serve our patients, uh, that the, the, the whole uh, healthcare atmosphere becomes more friendly and more cognizant uh, of, of that hard work that the, this, the, the healthcare team uh, is, is, is putting through this pandemic. Absolutely. Can I add, Absolutely. Mark? Yeah, um, Justin, please. Yeah, Jason. Um, as I... It's interesting. We're talking about fax machines and we're talking about racism and sexism still, right? And we're in 20 and it's um, can't we do better? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the I think any audience members like really what we're still I, when I've when I've been in uh, as a patient in scenarios, it's hard for me to understand that because I just feel such extreme humility and gratitude when somebody can help me. But I think why did why do these things happen? I think it's because we're in this pressure cooker right now. And um, I, yeah, Steve, really interesting data. Thanks for sharing that. Um, one comment that I made earlier around training on the EHR, one of the things that we have found that really helps is when you have good data pointing to which physicians or nurses are burning out. And so when we can look at things like HEP data within Epic, as an example, um, and, or we can look at, you know, that kind of how much signal, epic signal, when you can see how nurses or physicians 
are using the particular EHR and how efficient they are, or if you can see the same thing in like Cerner with lights on or advanced, being able to identify who's an inefficient user, who could benefit from training. And then you couple that with their individual survey response on the Arch Collaborative Survey. So you can look at satisfaction and how happy they are. That can really help point to scenarios where you can start to go out and address some of these individuals that are really struggling. And it's been fun for us to be able to get some of those anecdotes back from the organizations about what a difference that makes. But again, I stress that having the data to point to where you need to start, um, <clears throat> because sometimes it's just overwhelming and you don't know, well, how would I help our EHR experience to be better? Well, let's take a look at data and let's take, take those two data sets compiled together and let's look at where you can start to chunk that down. And that's been, again, very energizing for us as you talk about this training and, and EHR components. I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Deffels. I, you know, Jason, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I'd just like to underscore how important it is for folks like Anna and others who have access to the data and physician efficiency to look at it, identify outliers and offer help. This is gonna come as a big shock to you, but physicians have large egos, okay? Uh, we're not used to admitting that we're not, who knew? That's right, Mark. We're not used to admitting that we're weak. We're not used to admitting that we need help. And so we will struggle with an inefficient EHR that's not optimized and hasn't given me the personal training I need to use it efficiently without asking for help for a very long time before we ask for help because we're scared of being judged as not the superheroes that the public has said we are you know, during the pandemic and before. In fact, you know, we don't ask for help when we're struggling with burnout. We don't ask for help when we're struggling with anxiety and depression, and we've got to change that. And one way to change it is exactly as Jason said, look at the EHR, identify the outliers who are really inefficient in terms of the processes that they're doing, identify the folks that have an enormous amount of pajama time, and then go and offer them help. Don't say that there's something wrong with them. Say, we've got some real good solutions here. We think you would enjoy them. And I think that that could be really uh, well received. Well, wonderful. Said. Yeah, That's thank beautiful. you. So I, what I'd like to do, uh, because I always want to avoid being accused of being a Debbie Downer, is I'm going to ask each panelist to spend literally two minutes, share something that is in advance that's taking place either in your organization or something you're observing out in the world um, that, that brings us a little bit of hope. Because um, uh, I think we need some hope right now. Anna, would you like to begin? Yes, um, I, I would like to address um, just some of Jason and Steve's um, regarding the monitoring of data. And, you know, this is exciting because um, I'm working in an organization where they are monitoring and tracking um, physicians um, adoption or clinician adoption to certain initiatives. So it's not going to be, this isn't going to be innovative, but I think it kind of touches the point what Steve was making is that we have focus efforts on the clinician, the pajama time. And um, at Penn Medicine, we took, um, had a project called Focus. And it was really just to decrease clutter. There's a lot of data in the EHR. And um, some of it was focused on just improving usability or interpretation and looking at how somebody may wanna see clinical results or lab results in a quick, easy manner. We implement it also with like clinical decision support, but not to make sure it's overburdensome. And then have the dashboard that Steve and Jason mentioned is to monitor. And um, with that, this is the exciting part, it's not really, is that we were able to save 7,000 clicks um, and um, had also greater than 40 hours of prep time saved in a year. So this is where it's just incremental initiatives like this, but that ongoing monitor and adoption. And then for those clinicians that need a, an extra um, shoulder, to so, shoulder session is to offer that. We are an academic medical center. So we have constantly revolving doors of new trainees. And it's just to make sure we're cognizant of that because we will have to repeat that cycle of those one-to-one -one sessions on a regular basis. Right. 
Uh, that, wonderful points, Anna, and I just want to uh, support you by underscoring, yes, people think of academic medical centers as having more resources than community hospitals, and on a literal level, they do, but you pointed out something that is often forgotten. You're constantly training residents, right? So it's, it, you, you need those resources just to, you know, even tread water, right? compared to others. Uh, whereas in community hospitals, in many cases, you have physicians who have been there for 15 years and are going to be there for 20 years. And so you're um, in a community hospital, your um, use of the, the expenses around your resources will, will uh, stay with some of the same people over a period of time. So it's a very, a very different environment. So I appreciate your mentioning that. Uh, Dr. Chowie, uh, give us hope. A lot of hope. So since the uh, inception of our task force, we came up with this uh, paper, A Crisis in Healthcare, A Call to Action on Physician Burnout. And at the conclusion, we uh, had a six points uh, uh, on our and, and some stakeholders that we engaged uh, with us uh, on the task force. We engaged the insurance companies and uh, CMS and MassHealth and, and a lot of uh, the, 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 the people that we typically um, you know, do not talk with. We got them together and we have gotten so many positive feedback. For example, on the prior authorization end, we talked about gold carding, physicians that do a good job. We talked about a reduction in quality measures. And yes, the quality measures have been reduced since we've been talking about this. Uh, the referrals, we've been talking about some of the referrals being a waste of time. They are working with us. They are being partnering with us. So the insurance companies are now partnering with us, at least listening to us and helping us since they know we have been losing staff. Uh, they, 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 they now are working with us to help us and they know that with the pandemic, we got hit badly. So there is some discussions that are happening. There is a lot of headway going on on the interoperability of EHR. I know it's a marathon, it's not a sprint race. I understand, but we need to continue to focus on, the, on interoperability. Uh, on the medical students and residents standpoint, point, the, the med schools and residency programs are working on, on health, on, on, on work-life balance. And since the inception of our task force, uh, we received a commitment letter uh, uh, that was sent to the CEOs and the CMOs. And the letter was signed by 120 physicians and hospitals that are members of the Massachusetts Hospital Associations with the help of Dr. Steve DeFosse. Uh, and, and, and we now have uh, uh, chief wellness officers in most of the system. Not only they're there, they have task force on physicians' health in most of organ organizations, even smaller practices. And um, now they signed a letter of commitment uh, to make sure that clinician burnout is a, 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 a addressed and, and, and put in. Uh, last but not least, our board of registration in medicine uh, has, has significantly uh, uh, changed and followed some of the uh, adoption of the Federation of State Medical Boards of uh, Physician uh, Wellness and Burnout Recommendations, which is fantastic. Wonderful. So I know I sound like I'm at a tent revival meeting, but Dr. Def will say, give us hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I think all I can do is underscore a lot of the progress <clears throat> that Dr. Chow, mentioned and maybe you know put a little color on it from a national perspective. Uh, the CEO commitment letters that Dr. Chawi you know mentioned uh, are, are really remarkable. 120 MHA member hospitals and physician organizations had their CEO and CMO sign a letter committing to identify a measure of clinician wellness or burnout within their institution, uh, uh, try to improve it. Uh, measure it over time and report the results of that in their institutional dashboards. You know, so that I think is huge and it demonstrates the commitment of our leaders across the Commonwealth to address clinician burnout writ large in the state. You know, the idea of the board registration in medicine, um, it brings up the larger point, uh, which we've already touched on, which is um, physicians and clinicians in general are, are scared to admit we need help. 
And when it comes to mental illness, you know, we are human like everyone else. And when we're under stresses, you know, um, related to all these burdens we've discussed, as well as the actual fear that we may contract a lethal disease and bring it home to our families and give it to them, um, means that you know we suffer from stress and anxiety and depression like the rest of the public. But historically, doctors in particular have not gone and asked for professional help from a psychologist or psychiatrist or some kind of a counselor when we're suffering like this. And one of the main reasons is that we've spent our entire adult life to get credentialed to be able to become a physician and practice. And so the one thing none of us wanna do is put that credential and our license in jeopardy. And it turns out when the board registration in medicine sends you a renewal application every two or three years and asks, have you ever been treated for depression or have you ever been seen for any psychiatric disorder whatsoever? Do you think that's gonna be a chilling effect in terms of us asking for help? Of course it is. And so, you know, whether hospital recredentialing packages ask, have you ever been seen by a psychiatrist or whether insurance companies, medical malpractice providers or the state ask those kind of questions, it just shuts down our ability as clinicians to ask for help. And what's wonderful here is the FSMB or the Federation of State Medical Boards recommended to the entire country that state medical boards remove those questions. Of course, medical boards have a responsibility to make sure that we as physicians are practicing well. And so they should ask, do you have a medical condition which prohibit, per, you know, prohibits you from being able to practice medicine well? That's a reasonable thing to ask. Do I currently have a, something that's keeping me, if I've got Parkinson's disease and my hands are shaking, should I be operating on someone's brain? Probably not. They should ask that question. But they shouldn't say, in your entire life, dating back to when you were 13, have you ever seen a counselor for stress? And, and, and now the FSMB told the medical boards across the country, you shouldn't be asking these questions. In Massachusetts, at least, we removed those questions. And, um, and so that's really, I think, a ray, ray of sunshine and a ray of hope that we're moving the needle in the direction of health for our clinicians and therefore, ultimately, our patients. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, doctor. Jason, I know you can give us hope. Yeah, I, I love the discussion around, and, and the great work you guys are doing focused on burnout and, and making it less taboo, getting, getting it talked about, right? I know the work that we do just touches on it as we ask about it on the Arch Collaborative Survey. So um, I think it's wonderful that it's out in the open and it's, I, I see lots and lots of articles and press and, and uh, making it less taboo. Um, here's the challenge that I see. I'm not going to be a Debbie Downer, but I will say as I talk and, and my colleagues as well, we're in the business of reaching out to provider friends who give us data. That's how we report back to the industry. And um, so I do many, many phone calls with provider executives around the world, mostly around the country. And what I'm hearing is nurse shortages, um, ICUs full of COVID variant surging patients. Um, no, you know, that's, that's pretty obvious. Most of those are unvaccinated. One of the ones I've been hearing a little bit lately with from friends is these vaccine mandates of employees from the janitor all the way to the CEO, and they're nervous about the impact that's going to have on numbers. I think we all have anecdotes of provider uh, friends, nurses, or physicians who were burned out and quitting, and, and that's humbling to hear. We hope it doesn't get to that, but it's already taxing and already taxed um, organization when you're doing that. Here's... Um, what, what, what has the pandemic brought me personally that, or that I've seen in the, um, as a result of some of the other working conditions we have to work under? Um, telemedicine and virtual care have taken huge strides and it was forced to change the paradigm of how we look at that. And it really did tax those vendors initially, but it was amazing to see how they sprinted to catch up. And I, I think there's efficiency there. I don't think that replaces traditional care of patients, but it, it, it can streamline a lot of things and we were forced to look at that differently. Just from a, a personal standpoint, one of the things I love that the pandemic has taught me is technology has changed the way I interface with all of my friends around the world. I rarely pick up my phone anymore. I, I converse this way. And why does that matter? Well, because face-to-face -face interaction changes the relationship. And I can see people be like, that's crazy. I didn't know Steve looked like that or you know, Mark, it looks like you're doing well. And it's just different than just being on a conference call. And so that seems like a little thing, but I can just tell you 
in my in my world, it's all about who you know and who you have trust with and who you can pick up a phone and have a very quick call or a text or an email response from. And when you can count on those relationships and they're getting better because we can see each other, we can kind of gauge, uh, that's massive. And, and I, I so appreciate the technology that's allowed us to keep doing this, even though getting on airplanes is, is pretty challenging right now for some. So that's a, just a personal anecdote that I've personally really enjoyed as a result. Well, and I agree with you completely, Jason. Uh, just as a complete personal aside, about 20 years ago, I had a contentious phone call. I mean, we used the phone, so it was technology, with a friend who is against all technology. And honestly, this individual has challenges living in the contemporary world, which I can understand and empathize with. But the reality, and, and so she said she was she hates all technology and wants to go way back into the past. And I felt like saying before flush toilets and before the Emancipation Proclamation, but I actually didn't say that. But we, we are living in an era of technology and uh, the reality is we can either make it good or bad. And the key point in that conversation with that former friend was technology is actually neutral. Uh, technology is technology. One of the great things that all of you are doing is that you are involved in making it better. You're involved in making the technology work better for clinicians who are the bedrock of our system. So very last question for everyone, please leave our audience with a piece of advice or a prediction for how this journey will continue forward in the next few years. So either prediction or advice, unfortunately we don't really have time for both. <laughs> so you can choose. Anna, please go ahead. Um, great remarks, Mark. Um, I would say I'd leave with is to leverage technology and data to be meaningful for better visualization, to improve patient care, our clinicians, and to just really in, improve the user and the patient experience. Be thoughtful in that when you promote the interoperability of incorporating data, make sure it's at the right place in the right time. We do have also opportunities to incorporate new technologies such as artificial intelligence. As we bring that, those new technologies into our workplace, be thoughtful, have a scientific, logical approach, um, and make sure that it's good governance in order to strike the right balance, but leverage that technology and the data. Wonderful. Wow, I'd like to frame that. Thank you, Anna, that was terrific. Uh, Dr. Choey. For all the stakeholders in healthcare, we all have the same goal, is to deliver the best care for our patients. We are patients too. And we, we should be able to sit down together and put our heads together and get rid of all the burdens that are interfering with patient care. For our sakes and for the patient's sakes, for, the, for everyone's sake, let's sit down together. There's lots of brain power between IT and physician community and politicians and, and healthcare uh, uh, gurus out there. We can sit down like adults and get things done. Let, let's get it done, please. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Dr. Defosse. Well, I guess I'd just like to underscore, you're, everyone watching this is a healthcare leader. Many of you are clinicians. Do your part to remove the, bur the barriers to having you and your staff achieve and access uh, behavioral health care, mental health care. So if you're a clinician, uh, and you're a leader, model that it's okay to get mental health care. In fact, it's a good thing. Someone who accesses mental health care is better off than someone who doesn't. Um, if, you, if you are a leader, look at your credentialing packages and make sure you don't ask questions which limit or harm people's access to behavioral health care. And lastly, I'd just like to finish uh, with a beautiful African proverb, which is really apropos right now, which is, however long the night the dawn will indeed break. Mm, Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, doctor. Jason. I love that. Remove the mental health stigma. I, I you know, let's talk about this. It's real. And uh, let's, let's just, let's take it out of the dark and, and acknowledge it's real. 
I love Dr. Chowie's comment around how he loves the EHR. That's often not a, a frequent sentiment that I hear, right? Sometimes we've been so quick to beat up the vendors and liken the EHR to the worst thing in medicine. And why can't it do, why can't EHRs function like my travel apps or banking apps, or I can do it all on my phone and it's all interoperable and I can take out money in Australia with a four digit pin and have confidence it's gonna go from the right bank account, right? Why can't healthcare be like that? I've heard that so much over the last 20 years. Mark, you probably have as well. But healthcare is just different. And, and so what's the good news? I, EHR satisfaction's improving. And we've been watching that piece of it for four and a half years. And organizations that go out and follow the data and can help their clinicians to be better stewards of the EHR are improving because we go back and remeasure the organization and the satisfaction moves. And it's not technical stuff, largely. It's mostly just be helping these providers become better at how they use the technology. I know in my 20 years of watching Cerner and Epic and all scripts and Meditech and all these vendors, they have gotten better. I've been able to work so closely and talk with so many of their customers. So they're gonna get better and they feel the pressure to do so. But I think on the provider side, there's a responsibility. We can't just keep replacing EHRs and trying to go for the coveted EHR at some point you, most organizations are now on a go forward. So can we exercise some agency to get better at, at using those, follow the data to determine where, and then we've just, we've talked a lot about the impact that that can have on things like burnout. And so that's where I'm focused. And, and as I see the data improve at organizations, that's so energizing to my team and I. We started with a team of one on this. We're now to about 20 people. And we watch this every single day, just cheering these provider organizations who are able to improve. That, that gets me up in the morning. That's wonderful. And by the way, in reference to your uh, reference about uh, we've been hearing for so long that healthcare is different. I've been hearing that uh, since I had a full head of hair. So that was a while ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you said that, not me. <laughs> yes, yes. I. I refer to my baldness. Um, anyway, uh, here's the great news. All four of you are people who are engaged in the great enterprise of improving the EHR experience from your in your different roles. Uh, we are going to need to keep moving forward, as you all mentioned. But I do feel some hope because we've identified the problem. Uh, organizations are learning from each other. You know, and you're spreading that uh, knowledge to the Arch Collaborative, uh, you and your colleagues, Jason, and all of you in your patient care organizations and associations are doing work that is moving us forward. I really do see five years from now as being somewhat different, maybe not entirely different, but somewhat. And, and you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, and speaking of Rome, I'm going to conclude the session by quoting the Roman senator and orator Seneca from 2000 years ago, who said, since Dr. Defosse insisted on a quote or a proverb, I'm gonna include a, something of a proverb. Uh, Seneca said, those willing to change uh, the God's guide, those unwilling, they drag. And um, being dragged is a pretty bad thing. So I would hope that everyone in our audience will reflect on the wonderful wisdom that was shared here in this panel by four industry experts and consider what they can do to improve the experience for their clinicians and to make uh, working with the EHR just all around a better experience that will in improve uh, patient outcomes and the uh, efficacy of the healthcare system. So thank you to all four of you. This has been an absolutely wonderful panel. Uh, you've all been absolutely terrific. I know that our audience will have benefited from it. So this concludes this session. Thank you to everyone who uh, viewed in remotely and have a wonderful day, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you.